Welcome everybody to uh, the latest in this series of um, Guildhawk webinars. Um, my name is Gary Lace, I'm the Commercial Director of Guildhawk and I I'm delighted today uh, to be joined by David Beanie. Um, David is a man who um, I'm going to let introduce himself actually in a moment um, because he'll do a far better job of it than, than I will. But we're obviously here today to talk about an incredibly important topic. Um, we all know from uh, recent days that the pandemic continues to present its challenges um, for all of us, uh, both in and out of work, and, and, and well-being continues to be uh, an incredibly important topic, um, uh, both personally and professionally. And, and, and that's why today I'm delighted that we've got David here to talk about it. Um, the way that we're going to run this webinar, just so that everybody knows, is that David and I are going to have a, uh, a conversation, a chat, hopefully for about um, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then we're going to throw it open to one or two questions. And hopefully we'll be in and out within about kind of 50 minutes for those of you who want to, uh, to set your watches. But um, yeah, delighted that you could all join us. So without further ado, let's Let's crack on. David, um, if I may, um, I wonder whether you could just start. Thank you again for joining us. And I just wonder whether you could kick us off today by giving us a brief intro and talk about you and talk about the, the very important work that, that you do. Yeah. Hi, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is David Beanie. Um, I spent 36 years working in media, uh, not as a journalist. Um, I was on the commercial side of things. At one stage, I was the managing director of the Evening Telegraph in Northamptonshire, and I spent many years as a commercial director for Autotrader, the used car website. But throughout that 36 years, I had a big secret, a really big secret. And, and what was my secret? My secret was I was battling in private with my mental health. Even I'm surprised when I look back at my life that nobody knew about it at all. I'm quite sad to admit that that includes my ex-wife of 28 years, my mates down the pub, and certainly nobody I worked with knew about my battles with panic attacks and anxiety. But just over five years ago on a, a, a Monday morning in Manchester, my life changed forever when I outed myself and, and I spoke for the very first time uh, about my mental health. And it has changed my life. When I first shared my story, it resonated with more people and at a deeper level than anything I've ever done in my life before. However, and it's a big however, many people came up to me and said, um, can I be honest with you too? And I'd say, of course. And they would say, um, I would never share with my employer my true mental health because I think it would damage my career. And the more and more people I spoke to about my mental health, the more people shared with me that in short, they, they didn't trust their employers. So I made a big decision back at the beginning of 2017 that where I wanted to focus my energy was on helping employers to become kinder. And it's led me on a hell of a journey, a journey that I feel so lucky and privileged to, to have been on. To give you a flavour of my current work, um, I work with the Royal Navy. I'm helping them to get rid of their macho culture to make it easier for our sailors to be honest about their well-being. I'm not political at all, never have been. And somehow I've ended up being the advisor to the Labour Party on how to create a kinder culture um, within their own party. Um, I work with some incredibly diverse brands from McDonald's to Sainsbury's to Samsung to Google. And uh, as I say, I feel really, really lucky to do what I do. Just a, a few more things, Gary, if it's OK. Um, yeah, I, I spent 36 years in my career doing everything possible to avoid public speaking. And now I probably average one, one or two talks a day. So not surprisingly, when I was delivering one of my first ever talks, somebody put their hand up and said, um, sorry to interrupt you, David, but if you spent 36 years avoiding public speaking, how can you now do that every day? How are you gonna get through our session today, for example, without having a panic attack? And I can remember thinking, wow, what, what a great question. And I think I said two things. Firstly, I said, um, um, I can't promise you that I will because I still have panic attacks quite regularly. Uh, and, and secondly, there is a phrase that we associate with mental health that it's okay not to be okay. So is that how I get through this session today, even talking to Gary without having a panic attack? Because it's okay not to be okay. It's, it's not the main reason, but it helps a bit. Something else also helped me a few years ago. And I realized that you inspire people when you share vulnerability. 
it used to be regarded as weakness to talk at work, particularly about challenges with mental health. But trust me, these days, you inspire people when you share vulnerability. And it's even evidence-based now that a CEO is more likely to lose their job in a boardroom when they don't show weakness. Because to coin a sporting phrase, when you share vulnerability, you're more likely to keep the dressing room with you. So is that how I'm gonna get through this session without a panic attack? Because I think I'm inspiring you by sharing my vulnerability. Again, it probably helps a bit, but it's not the main reason. I've tried to find a cure for 40 years to my panic attacks. And cure is a really good word to use because I'll, I don't think I'll ever be cured. When I was chatting to Gary just before the start of today, we were having some fun talking about opera memorabilia and, and various things. And I would have come across to Gary really calm today, really relaxed, really quite on good form. That's just a mask. On the inside, I'm thinking, don't let Gary and Guildhawk down today. Don't have a panic attack during this session. They never go away. But I think I've realized what happens these days. Just when the demons are about to return, just when I feel my chest tightening, I say to myself, sod it, just have one. Show you all now and uh, what, a, what a panic attack looks like for me. I think the irony is the moment I give myself permission to have one, I reduce the chances of them happening. I spent most of my career panicking about my panic attacks. I was very hard on myself. I thought every day I had to be perfect. And in our careers, we're always talking about raising the bar. It's always about raising the bar. Well, guess what I've done? I've lowered my bar. I've lowered the pressure I put on myself every day. Um, but what I really wanna stress, by the way, I haven't lowered my standards. If anything, I've, um, I've improved my performance by being kinder to myself. I think I've discovered what they call the true value of self-compassion. And um, this is quite early in, in Gary and I's chat today, but I'd love you all to become more self-compassionate in 2022 and find ways of becoming kinder to yourself because you'd improve both your own well-being and you'd also improve your performance and the performance of your businesses if you could create a kinder culture across your organisations. Thank you, Gary. That's quite a long intro, but hopefully that gives people a flavour of me. Thank yeah, you. Not, a, not, a, not at all, actually. Um, a, a kind of perfect intro in a way, because I think what we want to do, David, um, is chat really about four things today. Well, as you know, Guildhawk um, are a, 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 a technology company, you know, we specialising in language services and language is really important to us. You know, the, the way that we unite uh, people through the power of language really matters and, and we do a huge amount of work obviously in that space so I just want to talk to you about the language of mental health in a minute because you know you and I have spoken about this a lot and I think it's truly and deeply relevant but then I also want to move on to there will be people on this call who are running organizations what does it mean for them well-being this topic how do they actually create well-being and, and build it as a strategic priority in their business there'll be people on this webinar who are running teams of people and have people within and under their watch for whom they care deeply how do they help them how do they help that team how do they help the individuals within that team and then all of us on this call are individuals and we all have you know to a greater or lesser extent good days and bad days and, and think about our own well-being so I then want to talk about how as an individual we can help ourselves to truly develop greater levels of well-being and greater awareness of what great well-being means so if we can I'd like to kind of cover those things and and the, the first of those is about the language of, of of mental health I'm going to call it because as we know that's the the popular um, phrase of the day and I know that you have a problem with that phrase and I know that you have a, a point of view about that phrase which I, I, I think is incredibly useful really for anybody um, thinking about this topic. So maybe talk about the language of mental health for a minute, David. Well, there's an irony, isn't there? Because I've uh, devoted the rest of my life to trying to get people to talk more openly about mental health. But I think the, um, the I've got an issue with the word mental. I, th I think we've changed the meaning of the word mental to become, um, it, it creates negative imagery in our heads. And it's part of the reason why people open up uh, struggle to open up to talk about this subject. Um, you've heard me refer in the past, Gary, to, uh, to, to I want to get to the stage where we can talk about mental health in the same way we talk about physical health. And at the moment, if we were trying to guess what we'd see on Google Images, if we typed in mental health, 
I think we're all picturing some guy like me with his head in his hands, looking really sad or mad and people pulling their hair out and lots of pictures of brains. And yet if we type into Google physical health, we're going to see images of, um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime and Usain Bolt and Cristiano Ronaldo and, and maybe Gary Lace. So um, I was about to say, actually, to be fair, certainly not me. <laughs> um, but you know the point I'm making. Why yeah, when yeah. we picture physical health, is it all really positive and mental health is all doom and gloom? Um, children are always going to run around the school playground saying, you're mental, you're mental. And I, I just think part of the problem people struggle to associate with mental health is, is that word mental. Um, the worst thing I could say to you, Gary, is, Gary, um, I'm worried about your mental health. Mm. It's one of the best ways to close you down. It, 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 it's just too invasive. Um, I've said tongue in cheek for a few years now. Um, I'd be quite happy to get rid of the word mental out of the dictionary and just talk about healthier minds. But in fairness to you, Gary, well, one thing that you've um, said to me, interestingly, when you drop the word health and you put mental with fitness or mental wellness, it suddenly conjures up a more positive um, imagery. And certainly with my work with the Royal Navy, we do talk a lot about mental fitness and I'm OK with that. I'm OK with that. So uh, interestingly, uh, I think it's when we put mental with health that it seems to that those two words together, um, pe people struggle with. Mm. So, for example, Gary, I, I do lots and lots of talks and workshops and the vast majority of them are not mandatory attendance. Um, you know, people come along if they choose to. One of the reasons some people choose not to come to those sessions is because it's about mental health and they're worried about coming to a, a session that um, may indicate to other people that they may have a problem. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, so and I think, sorry uh, to, to, to interrupt. And I think that somebody, um, Billy's just put up on, 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 on the chat, you know, that, that ultimately mental health is a, is a state of well-being like physical health. Yes. And, and, you know, it's a really good point, isn't it, that you can have good and you can have poor mental health. And by the way, you know, certainly my experience of it, David, I know I know this is borne out by the work you do, is it can alter day by day. Mm. Some days you wake up, you feel, you know, top of the world and other days you don't. And that's largely determined by all sorts of things. You know, the sleep you've had, what's on your mind at that time, what you've eaten, etc. So I, I think it's a good point about, you know, thinking about it. As a, as a state of well-being uh, but certainly this point about language mental fitness um uh, you know the words that you use i think are important and and developing a new language about it, it is also quite key i think around yeah, this space very much so gary um as, as you're aware um the first time i ever put a slide deck together about mental health um about i sent it out to some friends for feedback as we do and I can always remember everyone came back and said exactly the same thing. They all came back to me and said, uh, David, I like your slides, but do you mind me saying there's no numbers in them? And they said to me, surely if you're doing awareness training, regardless of subject matter, people like to read statistics. And I can remember saying, take this in the right spirit, but most statistics I read about mental health, I think are bullshit. And nobody knew about me for 36 years. And how many more people are out there like me that we don't even know about? And in many ways, Gary, I've been proved right. Um, I am not exaggerating. When I share with you, at least a thousand people have contacted me in recent times to share with me that they suffer in complete silence. Yeah. Many of them men and, and many of them quite senior in, in, their, in their roles. Um, I don't know where they get this statistic from, but they, they still reckon that every 20 people who contact work to say they're sick, when it comes to mental health, only a few people are telling the truth. Yeah, you know, the rest would rather say that they've um, they've got diarrhea or they've got a migraine or problems with one of the kids. So, um, I, I'm a huge supporter of the charity Mind. I've been a trustee for Mind. They do fantastic work in the world of mental health. If you'd have got them here today instead of me, they'd be talking about one in four. Yeah, it's a personal view, but I think statistics like one in four fuel stigma. And, and, and my mission is to is to eradicate stigma. I think when you when you think one in four, you're picturing four people and you're thinking, I wonder which one of those four it is. Yeah. And, and I think it also makes it more difficult for the one to speak out because they're different to the other three. As you know, Gary, I'm, I'm a, if, if we're going to change the way we think about this topic, 
we need a shift in mindset. And I think one of the ways to do that is to um, talk about one in one. Mm. Every, every single person listening to us now has health, both physical and mental. Some days your physical health can be better. Some days your, your mental health can be better. Um, we all have days when we have challenges going on up here. If you're not sleeping great at the moment, or if you're working hard, but you're, you're struggling to stay focused because you're worried about the kids or your parents or your partner, um, if, if your energy levels are low, all of that is your mental health as well. Yeah. And, and life's not easy. So as was said by, by somebody just now, we're, we all have good days and bad days. And um, we're not talking about mental illness today. We're yeah. talking about your mental health, which yeah. is simply what's going on up here and how you're feeling o- o- on any given day. And we'd like to start to refer to it as mental fitness, if you like, or, or, yep. or many of the other ways. So I think language yep. is a really important part of this. Um, just before we move on, uh, everybody actually on the, the webinar, I, I'm interested at this point in, we'll do a quick poll if we can. Let's see if this works, David. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But I'm interested in the question, is mental health a strategic, well-being, my apologies, well-being, do you think well-being is a strategic priority in your business today? Do you think it is a strategic priority? And it's a a pretty simple yes or no. Um, I'm just interested before we move on, you know, what do people think? Do they feel that it's a priority in their business? Um, Vote away if, uh, if you can, as a sort of prelude to, 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 to the next piece that, uh, that David and I want to talk about. And as those come in, David, um, let's move on actually to companies, organizations. I'm the CEO, I'm not actually, uh, but um, heaven forbid, but uh, fictionally, I'm the CEO of an organization. I want to make well-being a strategic priority. What do I do? Um... We're quite right. The, the tone has to come from the very, very top of the organization. Um, I always believe in being very frank and I still work for some organizations where if I'm honest, they're still ticking a box when it comes to mental health and their employees can see that because there's not sufficient regular evidence from the very top of the organization that well-being is a strategic priority. Um, one of my... Um, favorite stories from the pandemic about um, leadership comes from um, somebody you spoke to recently to do with uh, the book you're writing for me, Gary, Andy Alderson, who's the CEO of Vanarama. At the start of the pandemic last year, um, Andy put out a video um, to all of his staff, he even posted it on LinkedIn. And now Vanarama is a very, very commercial salesy type organization that employs lots of young people. Andy put in on this video, it went a little bit like this. He said, "Um, hi everybody. Um, At the moment, I don't care about sales. My my priority at the moment is your well-being and the well-being of your families. He said, what I'm gonna be doing over over the next number of months is uh, trying to make sure we've still got a great business that we're all still proud to work for at the end of this. And he said, I'm going to say it again now to all of you. At the moment, I don't care about sales. My priority is your well-being and the well-being of your people. Well, guess what happened, Gary? Sales sales went up dramatically. Mm. His people were so inspired by the authenticity of his messaging. Um, they, They wanted to work even harder for the organization. Now, let's keep this real. Does Andy Alderson, the CEO of Vanarama, care about sales? Absolutely. He's put his life into that business um, and he cares passionately about his business, but he also cares passionately about the well-being of his people. And that was one of my favorite examples of of leadership. I'll give you um, another two examples. Um, Yorkshire Housing. Yorkshire Housing um, got me involved with them about 12, 18 months ago, and they were really keen that every single employee in Yorkshire Housing Uh, could feel safe to open up and talk about their mental health. So from memory, I ended up doing um, something like about 12 workshops and about six talks for all of their staff across the organization. Their CEO cleared his diary so he could come to every single one of those workshops and talks 
And at the start of every talk, he used the first five minutes, not just to introduce me, but to share his own mental health challenges six years ago when he had a, a bit of a breakdown over the loss of his father. And by sharing his vulnerability uh, and by talking about his own um, battles with mental health, he was giving every single person permission in Yorkshire housing to also not be okay and to talk about mental health. But he, it, he wiped his diary out to come to every single one of those sessions because that's how important it was to him. And my, my final story on this, again, it, um, is about someone exceptionally senior in the Royal Navy, one of the most highly decorated military figures in this country. Um, only about, only about a month ago, um, he introduced me to hundreds and hundreds of sailors at a naval base in this country. And he spoke about his um, commitment to their well-being. And he also talked about his own challenges with mental health in quite a lot of detail. And he never, ever thought he'd ever talk about this in, in, in his life. And at the time he had a mental breakdown a few years ago, he went out of his way to keep it away from everybody. But now he shares his story because he knows by sharing his story, he's telling thousands of sailors in this country, it's okay not to be okay. You can have challenges with mental health and you can still have a great career. So this isn't about just, um, you know, doing one, one thing once a year on World Mental Health Day. It's not just about getting your business five mental health first aiders and saying, we've dealt with mental health in our organization because we've got a few mental health first aiders. This is about setting the tone from the very top of the organization and trying to make sure that the well-being of your people um, is actually probably on every agenda at a senior meeting. Because again, Gary, well-being is not a fluffy subject. No. It is so evidence-based now that when you create a culture where, where people feel valued and you care about their well-being, you won't lose your best people. Yeah. Um, you'll get less people going off sick and yeah. you will drive energy and engagement through that organization. So this is not a fluffy subject. This is not HR's latest thing. No. Um, <clears throat> and, and, yeah, and, and interestingly, the poll we did um, on a sample of, of the people on this call, uh, interestingly, 67% of people felt that, strategic, that, that well-being was a strategic Brilliant. priority. Now, I know that's not necessarily reflected in all the work that you do. Um, and you've just very kindly outed me as your ghostwriter as well for the book that we're doing together, um, which obviously, you know, you and I feel very passionately about this subject. Um, but one of the things I know we're going to talk about in that book in this space is really about turning the telescope around and saying, if you're the leader of an organisation, imagine that the people that you have within your um, charge and, and, and looking after don't work for you, but you work for them. Imagine how differently do you feel about this subject if you think this organization is working for them and is actually allowing them to lead their best professional lives and allowing them to find the best version of themselves from a well-being point of view. I think if you're the chief executive of an organization, if you turn the telescope around and think of it that way, it's quite a helpful thing to begin to kind of imagine. But I think that's useful, David, and, and very helpful in terms of you know, if you're the chief exec, if you're the leadership team, what, what, what is it that you need to be doing? And I guess that message from you is it has to come from the top and it cannot be token. It needs to be a consistent, determined effort to put well-being right at the heart of the company strategy. I'll just give a story in reverse of the stories that I just told. And I obviously won't name this client. I was asked to go to a business and do an all staff talk. And there was about 80, 80 to 90 people in the room. And I, I did a talk. And at the end of my talk, um, we got to the Q&A time. And some, some guy put his hand up and he said, um, it's not so much a question for David, it's more an observation. But has anybody noticed that there's not one of our senior managers or leaders in the room here today? And sadly, at this point, someone in the room quite junior in HR put their hand up and tried to explain they weren't there because they were all very busy. You can imagine how that went down on that day. Yeah. But um, I still sadly go to many organizations where um, no one senior seems to get, you know, even be aware the session is going on and doesn't give up any time, even to come in at the beginning or the end, mm. just to talk about 
you know, the importance of well-being to their organization. Yeah. Um, it's not always possible. I live in the real world, but it, in some organizations, it never happens. Yeah. Interesting and interesting and sad, I guess, in equal measure. Um, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, do put them in the the chat and we can deal with them, you know, a, a, as we go and, and certainly towards the end of this webinar. Um, OK, that's interesting, David. So we've talked about leadership and, and organisations. Talk to me now about I'm on this webinar and, and I, I look after a team of people. I don't necessarily lead the company, but I've got a, a really important group and team of people as the leader of that team. What am I looking out for? How can I how can I spot, um, you know, what are the signs that maybe some of my team are, are not feeling right at the top of their game and, and not feeling great when I do? What do I do to deal with it? How can I approach it best? And, and, and obviously, people, this is an area where it's very difficult because, again, going back to language, I think in my experience and I know in your experience, People find it very difficult to talk about it with other people because sometimes they don't know what language to use. Sometimes they don't know how to approach it. So I think uh, it would be really useful and helpful to get your guidance on that. You know, I'm leading a team. What do I do? How do I make this important? Um, firstly, just uh, um, experience has told me over the years that as managers and leaders at whatever level we're at in an organization, we put ourselves under far too much pressure to fix people when it comes to mental health. When it comes to physical health, we wouldn't dream of trying to fix them. We, we encourage them to see a doctor or, you know, dial 111 or go to A&E. But when it comes to mental health, for some reason, we seem to think we've got to sit there and, and sort people's lives out. With regards to what signs do we look for, we could come up today with an incredibly long list of, of, of signs from becoming withdrawn to becoming irritable, not looking after themselves, drinking too much. The list goes on and on and on and can become quite overwhelming. There's only one thing you can look for and it's any change in someone's normal behavior whatsoever. The more difficult thing to do is, is how do you approach them? How do you go up and say to them without making them feel uncomfortable or awkward? Now, a huge part of my training as a counselor is to notice, not interpret. What we tend to do with family and friends and people we care about, colleagues at work, we, tr we try and work out for ourselves what's going on. The trouble is when you do that, it's very easy to make someone feel judged and nobody likes to feel judged, but we are allowed to notice. So for example, we're, we're, we're good mates. Um, if you um, were normally you know, very easy going and mild mannered, but just recently had started biting my head off and becoming a, a big grumpy bear, I'm allowed to say to you, Gary, boy, mate, um, what's going on? Um, I've noticed recently you've become really irritable. Is everything OK? And because I'm noticing a change in your behaviour, you're more likely to share with me what's going on in Gary's world at the moment to make him behave like a grumpy bear. Yeah. So um, it's very important we notice we don't interpret. That's when we're looking for signs. If somebody comes to us um, about their mental health, um, just keeping it very simple today, a, a very simplistic framework. They'll be dreading your reaction. They're worried about being stigmatized. They're worried who else you're gonna tell this to. So they, they, they're probably feeling quite anxious and they've been putting off this conversation with you for a while. So the best thing you can do, um, however you react, should contain two very important words. And those two important words are, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. You then give someone a really good listening to. You put your mobile away, you shut your laptop, you do your best to be non-judgmental, sensitive, empathic, and you give them a, a really good listening to. Next, next part of this, once you've listened to them, you can be very kind and say what I'm about to say. You can say to somebody, look, thanks again for talking to me today. I really, really care about you, but I'm not qualified to deal with this. Now, what we need to do together is to get you the appropriate professional support. And at that stage, if you've got an employee assistance program, you would do your very, very best to encourage them to use your EAP. Or you may also consider um, encouraging them to go and see their GP, just like you would with a physical health issue. Your role is not to fix them. Your role is to create relationships where people feel they can talk to you. When they talk to you, you give them a good listening to. And, and once you've listened, when appropriate, you signpost professional help. And then very importantly, you stay on the journey with them. Um, most people won't contact your EAP. They don't like chatting to these faceless individuals on the end of a phone. So it's very important you say to that person, look, 
I do care. So let's get something in the diary so I can see how you're getting on. Now, that might be a week's time, two weeks time, might be the following day, but always stay on the journey with them. Well, I guess the key message I'm saying here, Gary, to, to leaders and managers, we're not there to fix people. You can say to someone, look, I care about you, but I can't, you know, I'm not qualified to deal with this. Let's together get you that, that right sort of professional support. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay. yeah. But Interesting. Just on that subject, I mean, a question that, that, that's come through, which I think is relevant to this topic. Um, think about it in reverse. This is a difficult one, but think about it in reverse because, you know, the, the cynic, the cynics would say, well, David, it's all well and good. You know, you, you, you get the organization at the top committed to, 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 to well-being. It becomes a strategic priority in the business. But let's be honest. Ah the most difficult thing in most people's lives is an immediate boss who's very toxic, right? And we've all worked with people that, frankly, yeah. you may not want to necessarily work with who have a really fundamental impact on your day-to-day -day working life. What do you do in that situation? It, you know, if you find yourself in that place where you're just working with somebody that you know is having an incredibly detrimental effect on your well-being, you know, how do you manage it? What do you do? What tips could you offer that person? I, I'm really glad you, you posed that because, yes, I've talked about the tone coming from the top, but you can work, as you said, for a brilliant organisation with a fantastic culture. But if your manager doesn't get it, you don't you don't get that experience. Often what you think of your manager is what you think of that organisation. Um, so to start with, um, we, we have to make sure that all of our managers are trained on the understanding of, of what this topic is all about and why it's not fluffy to, to check in with your people and ask them how they are and how if you want to be a decent leader and decent manager um, and you want to drive engagement and energy that you, you, you need to understand the power of how are you. Now, what, why I call it the power of how are you? Um, I'm allowed to share this insight from, from HSBC. Um, they got a fantastic reputation around well-being globally, but they carried out a survey a, a few years ago that involved 76,000 people on well-being. And they put lots of questions in the survey, but one was a very black and white question. It simply said, do we care about you? Yes or no. And to their shock, 38,000 people ticked no. 50% of the people in the survey said, you don't care about me. Now, luckily, they're brilliant with their data analytics. They drilled into the data. And they went looking for a common denominator and they, and they found it straight away. And it won't surprise you, but the common denominator was your line manager. They then drilled further into the data to see what does your manager do or not do to, um, to make you think they don't care about you. And it was really simple stuff. And it was that those managers went straight into talking about customers and sales and KPIs and objectives and so on, as opposed to saying, how are you? How are you doing? So, um, it's so, so critical that managers are aware that they need to start as many work conversations as they can by asking people how they are, but asking from here. Yeah. Now, as you said, Gary, we've all had managers who aren't very good at that. And it's very difficult to, if you're working for that person, to change that person's behavior. One thing you can do, which um, doesn't always work, is that when you're having a meeting with that manager, is you say to them at the start of the meeting, look, I know we've got a lot to get through, but how are you? How are you getting on? Because most managers will be quite surprised by that, but they are likely to tell you how they are. Mm. And then there's far more of a chance that they might equally say to you, how are you? Yeah. It's not a guarantee, no. but it, work, it can work both ways. And, and everyone can play a part in culture. So um, yes, it's harder to drive it upwards. I know that. Um, but what I would say as a mental health counsellor, if you're currently working for someone and they're, they're a bully and they're, they're not good for your mental well-being, the longer you stay in that relationship, the more damage you're doing to yourself. So get out, uh, move on, um, go and speak to their boss and, and tell them what the experience is like, because any business committed to well-being and a kind of culture should not keep people like that within their organisation. No. And, and, and interestingly, um, I'm just going to come on to something that uh, Christine has just posted um, uh, uh, on this topic. But, you know, the, the question, how are you, is an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, I wrote an article for someone this week around the importance of asking, how are you twice? Mm. And I, I know there are lots of people that advocate, 
you know, I, I will bump into you often, David, and say, how are you? And, and, and us Brits like to say, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. But actually, if I then follow up with, no, no, David, really, how are you? How are you feeling today? Actually, it, it has an impact. And, and it sort of, it sort of does really prioritise the kind of meaning behind the question. The problem with the phrase, how are you, is it's kind of often used as a throwaway, isn't it? Um, it's quite like saying hello. Yeah, people don't wait for the answer, you know, which is a bit frustrating. But anyway, just a quick one. Christina's just made the point. How can we make the process of coming forward less stressful for staff members in need? Should the, should the HR be trained? Would add, adding learning and development courses about wellness and mental well-being from time to time be helpful? And I guess our unequivocal answer to that would be not only helpful, but probably, probably integral and vital. And to me, the, the key training is not for HR, it's for managers. Um, every manager, it's a privilege to manage people. And they're the people who need training on, on well-being. You shouldn't have to go to HR about well-being. You should be able to talk to your manager. Uh, you should have a relationship with your manager where you can, they're the right person to say, do you know what? I'm struggling. Mm. Um, I'm a realist. And um, uh, there is a role for mental health first aiders, but if, the, if we lived in a perfect world, you wouldn't need them because you should be able to chat to your boss. But there'll always be some leaders and managers that are more difficult to speak to than others. And sometimes you just rather chat to someone other than your boss, which yeah. I think creates this role for uh, mental health first aiders or wellbeing champions. Yeah. Yes, of course, HR should be leading on this. And uh, of when, very often when I go into organisations, the first team that I do a workshop for is HR. Yeah. But too often poor HR um, you know they shouldn't own all of this mm. you know it, it should be the managers so the managers are the first people who need training yeah um, yeah yeah interesting okay thank you um let's just come on to individuals now uh, uh, as a sort of you know begin, beginning of, of kind of wrapping up the the main bit of this webinar um there are people on this call lots of people who care deeply about their well-being how can they help themselves What's the roadmap? What are the things they need to look out for? I, I know you've got a, a real perspective on this. And, and, and again, I, I know that you're passionate about it. I, I love the story you tell um, about the night in the pub when your best mate, you know, and, and maybe you'll, you'll start with that story. But, you know, what, what, what can I do tomorrow? What can uh, Christina do tomorrow? What can Billy do tomorrow to begin to make a big, a big difference to their own well-being? Um. In every session I do, I always do a, a piece around what we can do to become more uh, resilient ourselves. But I always um, praise it with, there's, there's nothing new here. Um, we all know what we should be doing. Um, so what I'll do just briefly, Gary, is remind people of the six or seven things that are really key to our mental resilience. Um, firstly, sleep. Um, I don't know about you, Gary, but when I'm tired, um, the world's a more difficult place to deal with. Yeah. When I'm getting good sleep, um, I'm a much better person. Um, and it, but it's not just about sufficient sleep. It's about regulating your sleep as well. Um, I'm a half 10 sort of guy. So I like to be asleep, I guess, by about 11. And I get up at half six most mornings. Um, you've just recently done some traveling. That plays havoc with your mental well-being because okay. you're in different time zones and it's really difficult. So number one is really, really try and make sure you're getting sufficient sleep and you're regulating your sleep secondly is physical exercise it's no coincidence that every government in the world's allowed us out for exercise uh, even during the strictest rules of lockdown so all of us however busy we are should be getting some exercise the third one is about me time the most important person in the world to love is not our mums it's not our kids it's not our partner it's not our dog it's ourselves the more we love ourselves the better person we become to people around us too many of us spend our lives running around after everyone else and not doing enough for ourselves. You've got to find more time for me time. We've also got to think about that old balance. Um, I think we used to call it work-life balance. These days, I tend to talk about work and play. This, this time last year, I, I, was, I was nearly ill. And I remember thinking, this is embarrassing, bear in mind the work that I do, that I think I'm going to become ill. But I realized I had the balance horribly wrong between work and play, which was easy to do during a lockdown because the things that I normally do to look after my well-being had all been shut down to me. I couldn't play squash. I couldn't go and watch my beloved Watford Football Club. I couldn't go down the pub. I couldn't go to my place in Bulgaria. 
and I was simply working harder and harder and harder. It, we, we've got to get that balance right. Another reason the pandemic's been tough for us is because we like to have things to look forward to. This is normally quite a good month of the year in some ways because most of us will be looking forward to Christmas. January is traditionally the worst month of the year because we've generally got not a lot to look forward to mm. and Easter seems miles away and holidays seem a long time away. Who we surround ourselves with is very important too. Um, again, it's not always possible to remove everybody from your life who drags you down, but generally we need to surround ourselves with people that love and respect us, people who make us feel good about ourselves, who give us good energy. And our diet's very important too. Um, you know, we are, you know, a healthy diet is, is, is a healthy mind. Um, I know at the moment that in the new year, I need to get a bit physically fitter again um, because I'm, I'm, I've been you know, not looking after my diet as much as I should do at the moment. Um, but yeah, I the do moment, Should we yeah, do that together? I think we should do, because I know the moment I start being sensible again, I'll feel better about myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's important. Yeah. No, so, so there's nothing new there, um, but they're all very, very important. The story you referred to just now, Gary, is um, I was sitting in a pub in London a few years ago and a, and a mate walked in and said, hi, David, how are you? And I said, I'm 52 out of 60. And he said, what do you mean you're 52 out of 60? And I said to him, um, I said, oh, Steve, a number of years ago, I was in a really bad place. I was coming out of a long term marriage. My career was at an end. And I sat down one day and thought, what are the different components of my life that make up my happiness? And I came up with six things. And every now and again, I give each of those six things a score out of 10 that gives me a score out of 60. We tend to focus in life on things that we can measure. Yeah. And one of the reasons we focus on our physical health, there's many ways of measuring it. You can measure your, your mental health. Um, you just need to be honest with yourself. And just going back to those six things, um, uh, those six things I came up with that, that measure my, how I'm doing in life was my main relationship in life, my family, my sense of purpose, my financial well-being, my physical well-being, and my mental well-being. And my view is that if all those six things are in a good place, then life's going to be good for David Beanie. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be energized. I'm going to be looking forward to the rest of my life. If any one of those six things is, is, is not in a good place, um, that's going to drag me down. So it's about focusing uh, on the one that's dragging you down and, and, and doing something about it. Um, I think that, listen, I think that, I mean... <laughs> Since you um, enlightened me, uh, you know, uh, over a year ago around that piece, it's been a tremendously useful thing for me to check in on. Um, and, and, you know, every three months, give, give yourself a score. Because, as you say, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but you only treasure what you can measure, right? And, and I think that trying to find a way of, of, of applying a score to it is really helpful. The other thing I would just say, just by, by way of a bit of reference material, you referenced sleep at the beginning. I mean, there is a chap called Matthew Walker. Uh, he's written probably the definitive book on sleep. Um, you could Google him and see no end of talks that he's given on YouTube, um, cut down versions of his book. I, I would heartily, wholeheartedly recommend anybody interested in discovering about sleep and what really it, it means to kind of have a look at Matthew Walker's work. Um, so David, thank you. I mean, language, organizations, teams, individuals. Um, we've got a couple more questions. I, I, I'll just deal with the last one, I think, and then we probably wrap up um, uh, with huge thanks to you for what's been a tremendous kind of uh, run through, really, some of the things I know you've learned over many, many years of, of, of this mm. important work. Um, but do, do you have any examples? I mean, Christina again has asked a quick question. Are there any examples on how, how do companies reevaluate the well-being training programs in response to COVID? Um, you know, how do trainings around mental well-being should, should be offered in an accessible manner for the remote environment? I mean, speak to that a little bit, because obviously, you know, you've had an enormous amount of experience now in, in COVID. Does this, does this, work work in a remote environment have you noticed it be less or more effective um i think it can work but we have to work harder and I'll, I'll explain what i mean by that a question i get asked every day is now we have a lot of people working virtually and working from homes 
they say to me, David, it's really difficult to keep an eye on my people in the same way as if I was in the office with them every single day. And I get that. I get that 100%. Of course I do. It, it's not the same. However, when we work virtually, it creates real opportunities for human connection. Um, in the last 18 months, by, by working on video cameras, I've met more cats and dogs. I've met more partners. I've met more uh, children than I've met in the previous 40 years of my working life. And why is that important? It's important because it's given me some really lovely connections uh, with, with people uh, and really humanistic collections and uh, connections. And why is that important? Because when I get to meet your partner or your kids or your dog, uh, we connect on a, on, a, on a deeper level. And if you're struggling one day, um, you're more likely to talk to someone who you feel you've got a connection with. You know, a great boss of mine once said to me, David, how's Sally's dog? And uh, I started laughing. And my boss said, what's funny about that? And I said, well, why would I ask about Sally's dog if I didn't even know Sally had a dog? And my boss didn't smile and said, well, you should do because Sally's dog's her life. Next time you see Sally, David, ask her about her dog. So I did do. And when I look back at my relationship with Sally, it went to a different level the day I asked her about her dog. So I, I was running a workshop this morning. I won't say for which client, but um, uh, a person on the call asked me a question about how do you keep an eye on your team when you're working remotely? And this person who asked me that question was the only person in the workshop who didn't put their camera on. Um, how can you keep an eye on people if we don't ha have cameras on? Mm. I'm not a big fan of these corporate backgrounds. Mm. Um, it's nice to see into people's houses. We were having a bit of fun earlier, Gary, that it looks like you've got that, um, that lampshade <laughs> on your head. Yeah, exactly. Things like that are great. <laughs> That's what we like. Moments like that is what this is all about. I've been so conscious of that during this um, entire webinar, not to lean back and look like I'm wearing my lampshade. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So what, what, what businesses have said to me is that if you are meeting in an office, your team, you're far more likely to all turn up into the room five minutes, 10 minutes early with a cup of coffee. You're much more likely to start the meeting by going around the room and having a non-work related check-in and finding a bit more time for each other. When we tend to do meetings on Teams and Zoom, we, they tend to be relentlessly back to back mm. and, and meetings are going straight into the working agenda. So I think we just need to work harder at checking in with people. Um, you're aware, Gary, I'm a big fan of the one to 10. Whenever I'm starting uh, meetings online, I get everybody to type in the chat function how they're feeling today in terms of energy. And yes. I quickly scan down those scores. And when you do that regularly, most people give the same score. So you're looking for variation. Yeah. Um, if anyone happens to score a particularly low score, I wouldn't say in that meeting, oh, Gary, why are you only a two today? But I've immediately made a note that immediately that meeting ends, I've got to contact Gary and say, Gary, I notice you're only a two. Is everything OK? Yeah. Because it's a very, going back to language again, it's a global language we all understand. Yeah. So there are ways we can keep an eye on each other and check in with each other um, when we work remotely but we do have to work harder at it. And we do yeah, have and, to be very conscious. Yeah, and, yeah. and as you know, you, you know, we, we at Guildhawk care very much about the, the, the next stage of all of our business lives and, and, and what does it look like for all of us to be connected uh, in, in this new kind of hybrid working. But most of all, what does it look like for people to feel really connected to themselves, their own well-being, and the organization in general? And um it's been a thrill, David, as ever, to chat to you. Um, as you know, you know we're, we're a company that, you know, we love to help and support our clients through the, the, the language services we offer. We think that, you know, we can do a great job for, for almost anybody in supporting them through, through language. But we also care deeply about some of the bigger issues that we face in, in, in you know, today's climate. And, and so through these webinars, we try and give our clients and our prospective clients a an insight into some of those important things. And, and obviously today, in my opinion, we're dealing with one of the most important, um, you know, how do you build well-being into organizations, into teams and into individuals? So it's been a delight. I'm so pleased to be able to chat to you. Thank you very much for giving us your time. 
Um, thank you very much for uh, everybody who's participated in this webinar today. Uh, our next one, just um, uh, kind of advance notice, will be um, uh, uh, in January, on January the 26th, where we will be tackling um, the incredibly important issue of climate change and sustainability, um, uh, particularly as it pertains to language, interestingly enough. So look out for that. We'll be letting people know that that's on its way. But in the meantime, um, David, thank you very, very much indeed. I've found it incredibly valuable. I've listened to this hundreds of times and every time I do, I learn something new. So I hope everybody's gleaned uh, at least something from it. So thank you very much indeed. And thanks everybody for joining us today and have a very happy, very restful and a very happy um, uh, new year. Here's everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.